All right. This is the annual organizational regular and special board meeting of December 14, 2021. It's now 4.06. We will begin roll call, please, Mary. President Lay. Here. Vice President Edera. Here. Clerk Chavez. Here. Member Cortese. Here. Member Doe. Here. Thank you. Welcome to the annual organizational regular and special board meeting of December 14, 2021. Are there any members of the public who would like to provide public comment to the board on a closed session agenda item at this time? See none, hear none. All right, the board will now recess to closed session. Thank you. All right, um, welcome to the annual organizational regular and special board meeting of December 14, 2021. We apologize, we run a little bit late today. It's a 6.20 right now. Member of the public, please submit your public comment online by accessing the form of the district homepage at www.esuhsd.org or the link on the agenda. Please limit your written comments to no more than 1,000 characters in length. Public comments submitted online will be read into the record. You may also raise your virtual hand in Zoom to request to speak. You will have two minutes to speak. Please note, all meetings are recorded. All regular and special meetings of the Board of Trustees and Board Study Session are streamed live on meeting nights and are also available for viewing the day after the meeting by accessing the district YouTube channel listed on the district webpage at www.esuhsd.org under the quick link section. The board is not able to respond to items that are not on the agenda or any personnel issues. Your comment will be read into the record and will be directed to the superintendent and or the appropriate staff member for response. Interpretation of this meeting in Spanish and Vietnamese can be heard by accessing the link and following the instructions shown on the agenda and the district website. Right now I move to, um, yeah, the adoption. We think we have, um, uh, oh, the Pledge of Illusions. I apologize, I was starting with Pledge of Illusions and I forgot about it. Uh, could we stand up to start with the Pledge of Illusions, please? Thank you. All right. So we also we already welcome item 4.01. So move to 5.01. The superintendent and all board members may request that items be removed from the agenda for consideration and or carry to a future board meeting for consideration and or action. And or that the board take action in a regular meeting on a subject not listed on the published agenda on an emergency basis or other basis allowed by law, GOV code 54954.2. I don't think anyone has any um, item to be removed. So move to item six, annual organizational meeting. So I think uh, Glenn, you're gonna take it away um, from the item six. To yeah, to the superintendent. Yes, I would love to do that. Uh, now is the time for our annual organizational meeting. Let's first say thank you for all the service that this group has done to this community in the last year in various roles, including that of our president, Von Lay. Let's give her at least five people. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Superintendent Glenn Randazzi. So with that said, we will now take nominations on 6.01. Uh, nominations for president, vice president, and clerk for one-year terms. I nominate uh, board vice president uh, Manuel Herrera. Vice uh, vice, for for, president. From vice president to president. Oh. <coughs> a, a second. Uh, okay, so um, we nominate uh, 
uh, board member Manuel Herrera to be president. The second by- Second by Patty Cortese. And I'd like to know if there's no discussion, uh, we'll call the vote. Is it all in favor? Are you willing? <laughs> yes, no, thank you very much, colleagues. I am very willing. <laughs> all right. So, so, so on, you can take it. Ordered by Von Ley, seconded by Patty Cortese. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Now take nominations for the role of vice president. I'd like to nominate uh, our current board, board clerk, Lorena Chavez, for vice president. Second. All in favor? Oh. Oh, Any yeah. discussion? And superintendent, superintendent and coin. And the question is, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Congratulations, uh, board member Lorena Travis as a vice president. Next position will be that of clerk. Any nominations for clerk? I'd like to nominate uh, Patty Cortezzi for clerk. I thought that we want to give to uh, board member Brian Doe. No, no. I, I will put for... Uh, oh. She's in oh, she's in the second last spot. Oh, okay. Okay, so, with that discussion, we'll so call the vote. All those in favor? Then, then I will be second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Very much. Congratulations to the three of you. We will now go move on to 6.02 nomination appointment for two board members to the board's standing audit committee. Chairperson and vice chair positions, one term only. I'm going to lay my chair again. Second. <laughs> 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 Hillary, are there any conflicts in terms of terms and consecutive terms with that, or are we okay there? Fantastic. So there's. Are you willing? Are you willing? Yes. We do it again. Nice try, Lorena. It was really well thought. So, so we settle with chair first. Uh, who nominate? Uh, I like to nominate over chair for the chair. Okay, so let come back. Oh, yeah, yeah. And anyone to second? I second. Okay. And are you willing? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. This, are you willing question? So, this is the first time I'm hearing it. <laughs> motion by Brian Doe, second by Von Ley for uh, Lorena Chavez, the chair of the uh, Standing Audit Committee. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Move uh, for board audit, Standing Audit Committee for Vice Chairperson Brian Doe. Second. Thank you. Any discussion around that item? He already expressed his willingness, so thank you for that. Brian, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you very much. We'll move on to 6.03. Nomination and appointment of one board member and one alternate board member um, as board liaison to the student governing board. And this is a one-year term. Currently, I'm, we have uh, member Cortez. Yes. Would you be willing to continue in that? Absolutely. Uh, for, uh, a um, motion for member Cortese to continue second. as board member. Okay, so board liaison. Motion by Manuel Herrera, second by Brian Doe for Patty Cortese to serve as the chairperson for the- Board liaison. Board liaison, excuse me, um, to the student governing board. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. If we could find one alternate board member. Who's currently the alternate? Do you want to continue? It would be my honor. All right, uh, and then I'll nominate. move to approve to uh, move to recommend Brian Doe as the alternate to the board liaison for the student governing board. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Moving on to six point oh four. Um, I move uh, to recommend uh, oh. Manuel Herrera to uh, serve as our um, representative to Metro Ed. Second. Second. I heard Von Ley there seconding. <laughs> so, well, moved by Patty Cortese or nominating uh, Manuel Herrera, seconded by Von Ley. Any discussion? All those in favor? Uh, oh, sorry, that was me. I, I should have been. Okay. 
<laughs> yeah, we have so the let's alternate. Let's move on to 6.05. This yeah. is the nomination and election of an alternative, an alternate representative to Metro Edsburg. Currently, Von Ley. Yeah, currently uh, I am um, alternate representative. I'd like to nominate Brian Doe to be alternate representative to Metro Ad Governing Board for one year term. Second. Manuel Herrera, second. Any discussion on that? All those in favor of Brian Doe as the altern uh, alternate? Aye. 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 Okay, we're moving on to 6.06, .06, nomination of one board member of the Board of Trustees to vote in the election of the Santa Clara County Committee on School District Organization. This is a one-year term. I, I believe I'm currently in that position and anyone can take it. it, it there's been no meeting, there's no action. It's a, uh, it just sits there in case it's ever activated. I could take it. Do we know what this is? Yeah. If someone wanted to break off a part of the district or create a new jurisdictional line, uh, this is the county body that has to review it and approve it in order for it to take effect. Yeah, and it doesn't meet unless there's an issue that arises. Thank you. I'll second that then. All okay. right. Thank you. All right, so a motion by board member Doe, seconded by Herrera. All those at discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Moving on to 6.07, nomination and election of representative to Santa Clara County School Boards Association. This is a one-year term. Who is uh, in that position right now? Um, yes, you want to say? All right, I'd like to nominate Lorena Chavez. Second. Okay, uh, moved by Don Lay, seconded by Manuel Herrera. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, moving on to 6.08. This is the nomination election of one member to the Eastside Alliance Advisory Committee. I'd like to nominate uh, board member Patty Cotesi. Patty, you're agreeable to that? Totally agreeable. Right. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, stay with me, y'all. All right, 6.09, nomination and election of one alternate member to the Eastside Alliance Advisory Committee. I'd like to nominate Brian Doe. Second. Thank you. Right, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Right, moving on to 610. Nomination and election of two members to the district's budget advisory committee. I know, right? Uh, I'm, I think I'm on it currently. I forget who I'm on. Who's, who's who, who's I think it's us two. Okay. I'd hmm. love it if y'all continued. I want to continue. So um, I want to nominate Patty Cortezzi um, and Brian Doe. Uh, Brian Doe. So, two members to the alternate. No, it's two, two members. members. Two, two members. Two members. Two members. Straight up. Two members to the district's budget advisory committee. Now you nominate Patty Cortezzi and Brian Doe. Second. I will go one by one on this. Uh, first recommendation is for Patty Cortezzi, uh, moved by Manuel Herreras, second in. Bunley, did you second that? Yeah, I'm second. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, second uh, motion is for the uh, nomination of Brian Doe. I'll nominate Brian Doe. Uh, that, uh, Manuel oh, already did. Yeah. Oh, we just <laughs> go by the same. Okay. Bunley second. Got it, got it, got it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 6.11, nomination and election of one alternate member to the district's budget advisory committee. I'll nominate, no, no, All right, I'll nominate Manuel Herrera. <laughs> alternate member. Second. Okay. Alternate member. <laughs> okay, what the heck? We have a motion by Patty Cortezzi, seconded by Brian Doe. Manuel has uh, said he's willing <laughs> as an alternate. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 
All right, now we have the appointment of board secretary. This Which, is a one year term. And it's a position filled by the superintendent and I would like to nominate <laughs> superintendent <laughs> Glenn Vanderzee. I don't think I have much choice in this. Do no, you, don't. you don't have any choice. Second. Absolutely. All right. All right, so we have Manuel Herrera and uh, Von Ley second. Yes. I'll spare you the discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Congratulations, all. To serve. Thank you. So, so seven point oh one. So the board will take a short break to allow the rotation of the new board officers. Okay. Okay. Stay here. Okay. I'll just stay here. Where I'll go. Where you tell me, Mary. I go right here. Yep. Okay. I haven't been in this seat for a long time. Thank you. Is that too loose? You can you can adjust it on the bottom. You can. Go ahead, take the chair. <laughs> Congratulations. Take the chair. I got a new neighbor. <laughs> Well, folks, um, it does feel different when you switch from one of the other four chairs and come and sit in the board president's chair. There's a, a sense of both being honored by your colleagues and a, and a greater sense of responsibility. And uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Von Ley, Trustee Von Ley, uh, her nearly 14 years of experience really shown through this past year with the confidence and competence with which she led the board and the district. And I want to echo the superintendent and second that emotion, Trustee Lay, uh, thank you for all that you did this past year as board president. And uh, we're going to move forward uh, with the agenda. And this we're at item eight, 8.01 under board special recognitions, staff, Building Equitable Communities Recognition, and who is responsible for that? Well, there's a lot of people building equitable communities, and thankfully, uh, Director Guerrero is here to share, um, share those that we're recognizing this month in December. The following staff are honored tonight for their work in supporting the building of equitable communities in our district. Our first honoree is Anna Woods, drama teacher and theater director at Piedmont Hills High School. She is being recognized by Principal Jeannie Davis, who states, Anna has been our drama teacher and theater director since 2010 and has done an outstanding job. Every time I attend a performance at Piedmont Hills, I'm blown away by the quality of the production and the talent that Anna can draw out of our students. I frequently hear students say that drama is their favorite class, and it is often the class they look forward to uh, going to the most. Anna has devoted nearly her entire professional career to Piedmont Hills. She truly is the heart and soul of our staff, and I'm so happy to be able to give her this recognition. Our next honoree is Elaine Pineris, Principal Secretary at Andrew Hill High School. She is recognized by Principal Jose Hernandez, and his kudos read as follows. For the last six years, Elaine Pineris has been the glue keeping Andrew Hill together. As a principal secretary, she is the person that runs the school. Elaine does her best to make sure that her positive energy drives us every day. There are times when professional health and personal challenges become daunting and she finds a way to remain positive. The stress is created by not having a substitute staff and a new business system have shown us how blessed we are 
to have Elaine here. I cannot say thank you enough. Thank you. Our next honoree is Genevieve Estrada. She is the Special Education Department Chair, the Inclusion Support Specialist at Mount Pleasant High School. And she is being honored by Dr. Cavallero, our Director of Special Services. She states, thank you to Genevieve Estrada for sharing her amazing talents with students with disabilities at Mount Pleasant High School. Jen has been an exceptional special education specialist, case manager, and department chair throughout her tenure with the district. This year, she has also taken on the role of inclusion support specialist, helping students, special education teachers, general education teachers, and administrators understand the overall benefits of inclusive and equitable practices. Our next honoree is Jennifer Eckley. She's a special education teacher and department chair at Andrew Hill High School. She is being recognized by Principal Jose Hernandez. His kudos read as follows. You will be recharged by being around the positive energy of Jennifer Eckley. Every year, Jennifer spends countless hours mentoring and supporting new special education case managers in writing IEPs and organizing their classes. Jennifer is constantly looking for ways to support all case managers and to make sure that all Andrew Hill students are receiving the services they need. Our special education department has made a concerted effort to support general education teachers in understanding disabilities and looking for ways to support students with disabilities. Jennifer is the driving force behind finding ways to support all students, especially those with disabilities. Another area that Jennifer helps us with is by being our great cheer coach. Jennifer is our source of positive cheer energy every time a Falcon needs a little pick me up. Thank you for being our past positive energy. Our next honoree is Jesus Lopez Martinez, a world language teacher in Spanish at Evergreen Valley High School. He is being recognized by Principal Kyle Kleckner, who states, Mr. Martinez has done excellent work helping all students feel welcomed as they are at Evergreen Valley High School. As a member of the ROAR MTSS team, Mr. Martinez has been instrumental in helping foster a positive school culture at Evergreen Valley High School and working to develop school-wide lessons on social emotional learning. Moreover, his work as advisor to the Evergreen Valley High School Folklorico has helped our Folklorico Club increase their presence on campus and celebrate our students' heritage. I know Mr. Martinez's work has helped our students feel like they belong and can be successful at Evergreen Valley High School. And I wanna thank him for all his efforts. Next up is Mr. Raymond Ramirez, MTSS teacher on special assignment from Oak Grove High School. He is being honored by Principal Martha Brazil. She states, Ray Ramirez embodies both the spirit and practice of building equitable communities. Walking around campus with him during break or lunch, it's hard to remember he's only been part of our st staff since August because he knows so many names and also because so many students call out his name with the kind of familiarity and trust that usually takes time. He does a remarkable job making everyone feel welcome and important from students and staff to parents and community members. Also, I think it's safe to speak for staff when I say that his thoughtful and creative assistance with classroom level support has been absolutely invaluable. Lastly, his ability to both capture and report on our campus bright spots through a community newsletter is a treasure. Our next honoree is Albert Christensen. He is a JROTC Senior Marine Instructor MTSS team member and grievance rep at Mount Pleasant High School. He is being recognized by Principal David Brown and his kudos read as follows. I am recognizing Albert Christensen for his dedication to both the students and staff at Mount Pleasant. Mr. Christensen builds strong and positive relationships with his students and he helps them cultivate leadership skills that can be used both in and out of school. Mr. Christensen's work in empowering students and supporting staff plays an important role in building equitable communities at our school. Thank you for all you do. 
Our next honoree is Deanna Glover, paraeducator at James Lake High School. She is being honored by Principal Honey Gubwan. And she states, Deanna Glover, also known as Ms. G or Coach G, is an integral part of our James Lake community. She lives and breathes being a part of an equitable community in her work that spans from our students with special needs to our student athletes. Ms. G truly welcomes all students as they are in the accepting and caring way that she engages and connects with students every day. She goes the extra mile in making sure that all of the students she supports in whatever capacity has the right supports in place, whether it's academically through her work as a para, socio-emotionally through her interactions with all students during break, lunch, and after school, or with her athletes as a softball coach. Our student and community truly appreciate and value Ms. G's efforts in making our school a better place where students can thrive and reach their goals and dreams. Our next honoree is Becky Feliciano, Attendance Secretary at Yerba Buena High School. And she is being honored by both Principal Mary Paulette and the APA Marco Osuna. Principal Paulette states that Ms. Becky Feliciano is being recognized for the work that, that she has done and continues to serve Yerba Buena High School, students and their families. Becky does a great job of ensuring that students and families feel welcomed and supported as an attendance secretary. She is great at her job. Becky works hard every day. She continues to work hard to support the YB community to ensure that students get everything they need to be successful. The kudos from Mr. Osuna read as follows. Ms. Feliciano keeps the attendance office humming without missing a beat. Her attention to detail is superb. All families, students, and staff always feel supported. It is a pleasure to have Mrs. Mrs. Feliciano at YB as my attendance secretary. And that concludes our honor for tonight. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's meaningful that uh, we put this on the record uh, and read it out loud publicly, however fleeting the moment of recognition is, uh, it is an authentic expression of recognition on the part of the board and the administration. Each one of you are carrying something important in our movement for an equitable uh, community and an equitable education. So we're gonna continue to do this in every board meeting, just acknowledgements. Uh, Mary Gillen, did you hear? There is, there is public comment on this. Huh? Public comment on this. And we have public comment from parent Kevin Larson under 801. Staff building needs to have staff buy-in and the need for new bond projects to be more properly vetted. This is not happening. And so it makes staff building that much more difficult at all ESU HSD with regard to establishing a proper environment through construction selections. That concludes not sure public how that comment. Fit at this point of the agenda, but okay, thank you. Um, we're going to move on with item 8.02. Uh, the McKinney Vento fundraising uh, moon festival. I'm going to ask my colleague Von Lay to please assist me on this. Well, as Von Lay is being recognized, oh, she's being recognized. If I can assist you on this one, that would oh, be superintendent, fantastic. Superintendent, please. That's right. So, you know, <laughs> the one thing about uh, East Side is we we gather as a community and we find ways to help. And I don't know if our community is aware of this, but pre-COVID, when we looked at our number of active students that were unhoused and qualified for McKinley Vento, McKinney Vento, that was last year in November. There were 204 active students. This year, post COVID, in the start of November, we had over 430 students actively identify as unhoused. And as you walked up to this building tonight, you know it's cold. And you know that there are expectations for this time of year. And I'm really uh, proud to say that last Friday, over 430 packages went out to our schools. Uh, thanks to the great work of student services for organizing and putting packets together for warm goods with socks and good things for people dealing with the weather, but also gift cards for being able to provide their families in unique ways during this, during this time of year. And while I want to thank all those that donated, and many did, and I want to thank ESTA and CSEA for their donations, tonight I, I would like to give special attention to Van Leyen and the Volvivam group for their work in 
one hosting the moon festival and i believe this is the 30th year of hosting the moon Fe uh, festival but not just I, this what's great about it is the, the moon festival stands as something that definitely represents our our community it upholds our culture and what we value but the group has also managed to turn it into a moment to direct services and and um, dollars towards those unhoused students so tonight I would like to ask Von Le and Vo Vivam America to come forward, um, as well as two special students that perhaps you can assist us with, or one student and another assistant, Tu Yen Fan and Jenny An Trudang of Independence High School for their efforts and fundraising um, for this year and organizing something that brought nearly $20,000 towards the McKinney Vento support. Let's give them a round of applause and ask them to come forward. I'd like to say a few words also. I know that, uh, and this is also our 10th anniversary of Makini Vento. We start uh, when the first, or actually this one of first year, I mean, the second year that I start as a, a school board trustee. And I know it's a time that uh, we just hire a, super, a former superintendent, Chris Funk. And uh, we took the project and we move on to, you know, all of those good things for our students and appreciate um, like uh, ESTA, CSEA, everyone has contributed, you know, in the um, fundraising for our McKinney Vento homeless student. I'm very proud that um, in the um, community, as well as the Vietnamese American community, and been put up together with uh, uh, Vo Vi Nam, uh, Miss Gumbin from Viet Vodao, America, uh, and uh, Jenny Andrew Dang from Independence High School and Duyang Fang. And I know that uh, it took a lot of effort uh, to organize it and fundraise it. But I know that uh, two years ago before COVID, we raised a little bit more money um, because we have more momentum uh, then uh, we also gave um, a wish list to our student. Uh, but this year, um, our student increased from 200 to 430, like twice the amount of student. So I think that uh, the amount of we fundraised this year, um, just enough to give them something that they feel comfortable, feel good, the socks, gift cards, and some necessity. Um, hopefully that maybe next year, we bring back the wish list uh, because I know that um, with the gift cards as well as the necessity for our student, um, we're still gonna miss them at the um, Christmas holiday because a lot of students need extra stuff. And when they wrote a, a little short a memo uh, for Chris Fung and I, and I know that uh, they mentioned about what do they need. And uh, from last uh, two years, and we gave bicycle, we gave laptops, we gave uh, a portion like a thousand dollar for one of the students that need to buy a car so they can go to work and they go to school. So this is an amazing story, really amazing when I look back that we have uh, organized on this dinner for all our student and family. And this room was packed of sibling, a pack of family, pack of everyone that come here. So I, I'm really proud of all the work from student services, from um, uh, our kitchen uh, and everyone has contributed. So for me, I'm just take a little credit with the hope that we continue to support our student and uh, I'm looking forward for many more years if I'm still in East Side. <laughs> Even Very though good. not, I'm still continue to work. So Von Le, if we could have you come forward, board members, if you could come forward and recognize our good friends from Volvivam, if you're here, if you could come forward, um, Twin Fan and also Jenny An Trudang, if you could come forward.
Next, we'd like to recognize Shiva Pham. And Shiva Pham, if you could come right on up, that'd be fantastic. Shiva is a student of Santa Teresa High School within our district. And knowing about the McKinney Vento need and our response to it uh, was influential and took it upon herself to fundraise and may, was able to make a donation of uh, dollars that she fundraised, a donation almost of $3,000 for this event. So we want to congratulate and thank Shiva for, for her actions in support of our community. Great job, Shiva. Um, I would like to say that uh, for the Moon Festival Organizing Committee, looking forward for uh, your support again next year uh, to help the momentum and for the culture, keep the tradition, the culture in Shiva. Uh, congratulations. You did a good job, awesome job uh, at Santa Teresa. Actually, Shiva also one of the... Um, a student who coined uh, the um, performance at the Moon Festival, and she recognized that we raised fund for the Moon Festival, and she's by herself raised fund uh, and come up with you know with very good idea, and we raised almost three thousand. Thank you, the mother Jenny, All right. and uh, we hope to see you again uh, next year. All right. All right, now you can go home. You don't have to stay here. Jenny, um, good student of independence. And I know you're a senior right now. So you probably has a lot of uh, homework, right? So you can, uh, if you want to stay here with us, you're welcome, but you can take off if you want to, okay? All right, thank you everyone. <clears throat> thank you for uh, these recognitions. And we're gonna move on to item 9.01, which is our student board liaison, Paula Escobar and her report. Hi everyone, I hope you're all doing well today. Um, first of all, I wanted to um, kind of shout out, um, he was recognized earlier, Senor Martinez from Evergreen Valley High School, who was recognized by my principal earlier. And I just wanted to kind of attest to that, that Senor Martinez is a really great teacher and all those things that um, Mr. Klockner decided to feature about him are very true. I'm part of his um, AP Spanish literature class and um, the environment in that classroom is 
very inclusive and I feel like all the students are able to engage with the content and really feel really included in that classroom and it's just really a great space to be in I feel so honored to have met Senor Martinez so I don't know if he's watching but muchas gracias Senor Martinez thank you Senor Martinez and um as you may know, a lot of us students are in finals right now. And so it was very, especially stressful time. I feel like um, as a senior, it kind of feels like you're still a sophomore having to um, pick up your study habits again and really get into um, the pressure of trying to balance all these grades and do all these different things. And I don't know if any of the student is listening right now, but I hope that um, you're taking care of yourselves. I know that's what we did at SUB this week. We made sure to have a really short meeting because a lot of us are busy with finals and a lot of us are just really stressed about that right now. But I know that in the next month, especially within the scope of SUB January, we're going to have a lot of stuff to do and we're going to have a lot of longer meetings specifically around our SUB bylaws, as well as things we've talked about before and really just kind of focusing on them more because um, we really believe that um, we we'll, we have the power and potential to make a difference in our district. And um, I'm really proud of what SUB has accomplished in the year 2021. And I can't wait to see what we do in the years to come. And also, um, I want to wish everyone just um, have a relaxing break. I know like for me, especially like in like every other student, we're just kind of trying to get through this week, but I know we can do it. I know we can all fish strong and, you know, um, we're able to have a relaxing break right after. Thank you, that concludes your report. Very good. <clears throat> Moving on to item 10, special order of business 10.01. Uh, this is an opportunity for the superintendent or board members to request that any items be considered, discussed, and acted on out of the published order. Is there any such request? There is not. Hearing none. Moving on to item point 1002, presentation, discussion, and or action regarding review of district's debt management by Dale Scott from Dale Scott and Company. And Mr. Scott, you can come forward, make sure the microphone is turned on and make sure that it's uh, pointed more to your, towards you. there you go. Good. Everybody can hear me. Thank you. Good evening. I wanted to um, take you through a analysis of where you are in your debt profile and some plant potential plans for the future. So I believe if I can have the presentation go to page three, that would be great. As most of you know, the repayment of the district's bonds is predicated on the assessed valuation of the district. That's all of the property, not the district's property, but all the private property in the district, commercial, industrial, apartments, et cetera, et cetera, as well as residential. This table shows the growth of that assessed valuation since 1997. You can see it has been, especially the last 10 years, very robust at a average rate of over 5% for the last 10 years, almost 5% for the last 20 years. So even though it's been a strong growth as we go forward in putting these plans together, we always try to take a somewhat conservative view on that growth because you look back at the year 2008, 2009, there was that dip, it could happen again. So we wanna build in some uh, conservatism in those numbers, but still very strong. Turning to page four, this is a listing of all of the measures that have been placed before, bond measures that have been placed before the voters uh, since 1991. Extraordinarily supportive voters in this district. Um, every one of these issues with the exception of measure J in 2020 passed uh, sometimes overwhelmingly. What I really wanna point out here is the column to the far right. Um, there are only two measures that still have any funding available from them. Uh, that's the measure, the EdTech measure from 2014, there's $47 million remaining. And then the bond in 2016 of which there's $171 million remaining. And I'll talk about those in just a minute. On the following page, and by the way, if there are any questions, please feel free to interrupt and ask. On page five, you can see the voters have not been quite as supportive 
in the parcel tax measures. Now remember that starting in the year 2001, general obligation bonds only take 55%, parcel tax takes two thirds approval, but still this has been difficult for the district. I have some thoughts about that we can talk about as we go forward, um, but there has been now five attempts to pass a parcel tax. None of them would the have passed the last one in June of uh, June of 2018. Got very close, 65.5, but still couldn't get there. Yes, sir. that's tended to be true pretty much statewide for other districts similarly pursuing parcel tax. Mm, I think it has to do with when the districts try and what the demographics are of the district. Um, parcel tax tend to be. Um, smaller districts and more affluent districts. But that's not to say you can't pass them, but that tends to be where they get passed. Um, and when you get out of the Bay Area, they're pretty rare. And you still see them every once in a while, but it's really a Bay Area phenomenon. And, and then parts of Los Angeles. On next slide, page six. This is a listing of all of the financings that are outstanding, meaning these are the financings that are still being repaid that have been issued and the funds spent. And now you're seeing them being repaid by the taxpayers of the district. Um, the most important column here is again on the far right, the optional call date. What that means is that is the date at which they can be refinanced into lower interest rates if that works. And of course, in this market, it works almost all the time. But we can't really refinance those until that call date. Now, there have been some, um, there have been some advisors that have suggested to their clients that they do it in what is called a taxable me method, meaning it would be higher interest rates. You wouldn't get as much savings. <clears throat> we tend to think it's better to just hang on to those. Just wait it out, wait till you get to the ability to do the tax exempt and produce even greater savings for the taxpayers at that time. But you only have one that's coming up next year. Uh, that would be the 2012 refunding. So that would actually be a refinancing of a refinancing that we did previously. And I'll show you that in a second, but really it will start beginning in 23 and 24 and 25. Every year you're gonna be able to bring those tax rates down more. Now, what what are the are you, are you going to get into this? What the rates are? What currently on these? Yeah, what were the interest rates at uh, each, each of these? Each one is different. Each one is uh, can be complicated. What you can really you can see looking at the final maturity, they all have different maturities. That's going to be different rates. They were all sold at different times. However, I will say that by and large all of those financings would produce savings in the, given the current market. Now that may change by the time you get there, but I think you just take them one at a time. Uh, you'll see in the, the example for the 2012 refunding, there's substantial savings currently. Now that could change by the time we get there because it's variable rate, but if it changes too much, then we just wait. And then we wait until hopefully rates come down again. Um, I know there's been a lot of talk about inflation and everybody's sensitive to that and rates going up. Oddly enough, that has not been the situation in the tax exempt market. Rates remain low. That has a lot to do with the fact there's just not a lot of financing is being done and there's a lot more demand for those bonds. That might change, of course. But right now, those, re those rates remain quite low and the refinancings that are coming at you in the next couple of years, I think are going to be... Uh, very profitable for the taxpayers. Uh, sure, let's look at the next page, page seven. This is the 2012 refinancing. You can see that the average rate on the bonds that were, um, that are outstanding, if you go on the, the table on the right-hand side, is about four and a half percent, four point four seven percent. Now, when those bonds were sold, remember they were longer, longer term. Those might have been 10, 15 year maturities. Now we're only looking at them being paid back under six years. And so two things are going on at the same time. One, rates have fallen, plus they're shorter term, and shorter term bonds have lower interest rates. So in today's market, that average interest rate would be 0.95. Pretty big difference. Four and a half percent to really one percent, and that's where this savings comes. Net of cost, there would be about 
$1.9 million of savings. So smaller financing, but that's the kind of savings that should be starting to generate um, over time. Good? Is that clear? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, turning to page eight. So if we take all of the financings, kind of putting these two pieces of the puzzle together, all of the outstanding financings, and we take a relatively conservative view of interest of assessed valuation growth, in this case, three and a half percent per year, which is far below what you've been. This is what the tax rates, estimated tax rate per $100,000 of assessed valuation is projected to look like over the next 20 years or so. Now, this is something that you as a board should be very proud of. I mean, this is truly remarkable to see these rates declining like this. Typically, they're going up as, as districts continue to borrow more and borrow more. But I think because of the prudence of the boards in the past, you're seeing these rates really fall significantly. And you've done a lot of short-term financings to try to pay those off quickly, which I think has been good. So this gives you a lot of opportunities as we go forward, but let's look at the other two measures first that still have bonds to be issued and see the impact of that. On so this page, uh, are the current inflationary dynamics gonna impact any of these tax rate projections, do you think? No, no, those rates are set. Those are those, the interest rates on these bonds are set. Now, what would affect these uh, tax rates would be changes in the assessed valuation growth rate. So if assessed valuation grows at faster than three and a half percent, those rates would be lower. If assessed valuation goes down, then those rates would be higher. But in terms of the inflationary effect on interest rates, no, it would have no impact on these. Yeah, that's Let's go back to page three. Thanks. Um, so this is the past, um, well, it's over 20 years, maybe 25 years. Remember assessed valuation and market valuations are different. So I know that, I mean, I know that the value of housing has been skyrocketing, but assessed valuation really lags on that because assessed valuation is, cannot grow by more than 2% per year, regardless of what is happening to the market value of that house until the owner sells the house. And then it's reassessed at the market or at the purchase price or the sales price. So you can see here in the, uh, when you say, what, ha what has it been in the past? Well, over the past 20 years, it's been 4.6% average. Um, in the past five years, it's been 5.6% average. There's some reason to believe that, that that's going to take a while before that goes down significantly, absent a big crash. And that's because of just what you've just said. There is a lot of value in real estate that's not being reflected in this table. Um, and that's why I think 3.5% is probably a little too conservative, frankly, but I feel good about it. That's absolutely correct. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's underestimated simply because it hasn't been realized or underrealized. I guess that's the way to put it. Okay, let's look at slide nine. So remember, I said that you had two measures that still had funds available to be used. The first was the, um, the ed tech. Um, so measure I, make sure I have that right. If that was the EdTech. Yes, measure I, the EdTech bond. Um, you have one uh, or two financing remaining on this. We're projecting the final series to be done in 2022. And you can see on that table, the remaining authorization at that time will be zero. So that will have run its course. But as soon as you want the $47 million in 22, is what is, that is what has been planned. 
On page 10, you see the measure Z. The plan is to issue the remaining bonds of that in 2024. And then that would be done. So the question is, what do you do at that time? Now, if you look at this table on page 10, uh, chart on page 10, you still see the same thing, which is even with these new bonds coming on, you still see this declining, uh, declining tax rate over time. So one thing I would suggest you consider, turning to page 11, is to go to the voters in November of 2022 and ask them if they want to have an additional bond so long as the tax rate remains the same. And that is called a tax rate extension. Now that's not a legal term, that's just the way we structure it. But you can see in this case, there would be no increase in the projected tax rate going forward. In fact, it would fall after five or six years. And that would produce approximately $537 million of additional funding uh, uh, for the district. Now, I'm not saying it has to be 537. It can be the lower amount, it can be a somewhat higher amount, but you can do somewhere in that range and put it together in a way where you can tell voters in the ballot, this will be structured so that it does not increase projected future tax rates. Any questions on that? Board Member Doe, could I ask you to put your microphone on so the members that are participating in Zoom can hear? Yes, thank you. I apologize for that. I, I um, should have turned it on. Um, this is more, more of a, not a financial question, but whether the, uh, whether the, the turnout of 2022 would affect that same recommendation that you would have or not. Um, in terms of whether the voter will be yes. find a, the right yes, to be palatable. No, I, I understand. That's a very good question. I think this is actually a recommendation that you would want to go forward with in an environment where you anticipated a potentially low turnout, because it is a fiscally conservative recommendation. So in the uh, higher turnouts, I mean, in a higher turnout election, you tend to have voters that are um, more casual. Maybe they are not as fiscally conservative. And so uh, often districts will have larger bonds during a presidential election, for example. In 2022, clearly we don't know what that turnout would be, but I think it is going to be, uh, to your point, I think it is gonna be statewide a difficult election, um, regardless of the district. And that's why I'm comfortable with the recommendation of a tax rate extension, given what could be a difficult election period. When you say difficult, what do you mean by that? Difficult election year? Um, I think that the turnout may, uh, to the board members uh, uh, comment, I think the turnout may not be as great as it has been in the past. Now that's possibly, I mean, you have a, gov a democratic incumbent governor, um, unclear what, the, what is going to drive uh, turnout. That's not to say that can't change very quickly, um, but that's looking at it now. And then I think also, uh, voters are still a little unsettled, um, and it might be a difficult, it might be a difficult election across the board um, because I don't think we just don't know where people are going to be, and I'm not trying to predict it, but I just don't know where people are going to be in November of 2022. That's why I come back to saying, let's come out. You're going to need funding. I have another point that I want to make on that as well, but you're going to need funding. And let's put it together in a way that produces enough funding for current projects and do it in a way that you can say to voters, we're not asking for more, we're asking for you to stay where you are now and extend it. And I think that's a powerful message. So the way that this would be on the ballot would be bond extension. Is that how it would, because I know in the, language matters. In the land, yes. That's correct. In the language, it would say that it would, uh, with no increase in current tax rate, no increase in current estimated tax rates. Have, have you done these before in other? Oh, yeah. Yes. 
And what do you see is like a, a key factor or something that's in place where these have been successful? This type of structure is, I mean, it's hard to call it in a relative point, but this type of structure is almost always more successful than the alternative. And the reason is, just think of it how you hear it, when you're saying, I want to increase your taxes versus I want you to continue to pay what you're paying now to extend your taxes. It's a different way of, peop of, of people's reaction to that. And so the um, uh, person who is concerned about their taxes can say, okay, I don't wanna pay more, but I'm willing to pay the same in order to improve the schools. No, I'm sorry, this is 55%. Uh, 55% of the vote for it to pass. 55% of the, the people audience who doesn't. vote. Yeah. <laughs> of those who vote. Yeah, of those who turn out to vote. Right. However, there is another reason I think this is something you should consider. Um, and that is remember the table that I showed you on your parcel tax elections. Um, and so again, to your point of turnout, um, if that is something that you are considering, it's not a recommendation I'm making, I'm saying if you are considering doing that again and getting on the ballot with a parcel tax, the obvious date to be on the ballot is in the presidential election in 2024. So remember your elections are pretty much limited to even years in November, November 22, November 24, November 26, gubernatorial, presidential, gubernatorial. If you're going to try a parcel tax, I would strongly recommend that you consider that November of 2024 date. So that means if you're thinking about your funding for projects, it's either 22 or 26, and 26 is a long way away. So that's why I'm bringing this to you tonight as a kind of layout. And you can see this on the next page, page 12, which kind of tries to sum up everything I've discussed in a timeline. So coming at you in the first and second quarter of 2022, if you followed this path, would be um, voter research, uh, which we are, which we have done for the district in the past. Um, issue the remainder of the ed tech bond uh, in the 47 million. Uh, do the refinancing that I described uh, to lower tax rates um, for the taxpayers. And then sometime in the second quarter, place the tax rate extension on the November 22 ballot. That election would be in November of 22. There would be additional refinancings in 23, and you would have a pathway then to consider, not asking for any decisions, obviously, until you get there, but to consider a potential for a parcel tax election in November of 24. So tonight, this presentation is more educational, and the administration will take it under consideration and bring back a recommendation. Correct. That's where we're going. Okay. Well, I'm always impressed by the sureness of your uh, information and expertise. Um, so appreciate the presentation tonight. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, Amber Cortezzi. Um, yeah, so um, if we did not do this in 2022, what would happen to the what would be the impact on on taxpayers if we if we did that right now? Well, the impact would be um, in future years, the tax rates would go down slightly until you did another bond. But there would be a dip in those tax rates um, in the near term. Got it. Okay. But from the from what you are presenting. You do not recommend to the 2024 presidential election year because of higher turnout. I would recommend uh, holding that year as a potential parcel tax election if that is something the board wishes to, con to consider. If not, uh, the 2024 election or the 2022 election would work for a bond um, and would work well. But I think it works better for a parcel tax. 
from the rate perspective, um, do you anticipate an increase in rate um, if we, we do not engage in a partial tax or, or extension of partial tax in 22? Do you expect an increase in, based on the uh, current economic climate? Well, it's hard not to, and I'll show you why. If we can go back to slide um, 11. At a, at a certain point, the rates begin to fall. And so then you're going back and asking voters to re-increase your rates, if you will. So at a certain rate, I mean, 24 works fine. 26 would probably work as well. Um, but beyond that, it's gonna be difficult to say, we're not going to increase your tax rates because those rates are falling. Correct, because they've already, exactly. Um, in addition, just keep in mind, as you're considering this, um, you are getting close to being out of money from those bond measures. Um, not to say that they're not gonna, those funds are not gonna be spent well and they're gonna hold you over, but at a certain point in time, that cupboard's gonna be empty and you're gonna need to think about what are we going to do to continue improving the classrooms that will continue to deteriorate um, over time. Um, I was wondering that uh, this is refinancing for of 2012 refunding bond, correct? Yeah. That you must make presentation. And on refinancing summary, um, I think that uh, we mentioned that present value saving as percentage of principal refunded is 10.82%. Could you... Um, explain a little bit more. When you mentioned about refinancing the 2012 refunding bond, so when we refinance it, then the fund will go back to the district or go back to the bond. Could you explain a little sure. bit more? Because I know that it's been a while when we talk about refinance bond, we will mix up at uh, one time with the uh, parcel tax, but I know this is not a parcel tax. It's very easy to look into that. But for refinance, does any um, consequences, uh, you know, for the voter to look into, then they will might mix up, this is like a parcel tax? Um, no, I don't think so. In a refinancing or refunding, sometimes it's called, all of the savings goes back to the taxpayers. Um, there's none of that funding that comes back into the district uh, for uses for either facilities or for operational use, and that's by state law. So there's no ability to say, oh, we're not gonna need the parcel tax because we're gonna refinance these bonds. They're in separate pots. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the clarification. Uh, there are no other comments. Mr. Scott, thank you again for your presentation. And uh, we're going to be looking to the administration at some point to bring a recommendation forward on this matter. <laughs> Proceeding with the agenda item 10.03 on discussion and or action uh, to receive and approve the first interim financial report. Pres uh, President Herrera. Before moving on, I believe there's public comment on 10.02. Oh, I'm sorry, the item we were just on. Yes. yes. Okay, will you have public comment and please read that. Public comment from parent Kevin Larson. While it is good to have companies bring debt down with better interest rates, it could be ESUHSD used cab bonds and overspent, and this process is due to bad spending by ESUHSD in the past. That is all we have under this item. Thank you. And that was on item 10.02 on the review of the district's debt management. Uh, moving on again to 10.03, Mr. Willian, uh, presentation on the first interim financial report. Thank you. Good evening, board, staff, and uh, community. Uh, I'm Ron Wheelahan. I'll read my name into the record, interim associate superintendent of business. Thank you. And 
I apologize, Paul and Ryan. I'm going to probably have my back to you a little bit. Um, first off, I want to thank. Um, and make so, sure your microphone is and pointing get the, towards and the you. mic there too. Um, a little rusty uh, coming out of retirement to do a board presentation. I'll do I'll do the best I can. Um, so I want to thank Sylvia Palio for her great work in producing the book. Um, excellent job. A lot of information in here. Um, as you know, we're in a different cycles of the budget throughout the year. Um, we presented in August the 45 day revision. And tonight we're going to do the first interim in March. I hope to be here for the second interim before I, I move on to uh, some traveling. And then in January, we'll be bringing the final audits. Uh, we've met with the audit committee. It looks like we're on track. And in January, we'll be looking at the governor's proposal, some exciting news out of Sacramento. And in the June area, we'll be looking at budget and getting that ready. So we're in the middle of the cycle. So right now our goal is to take a look at the first four months of data from October 31 and true up our budget. Uh, we're bringing forward a positive uh, cer certification of on the budget. Um, it still includes the solvency resolution the board made in June. It is an action item and we're looking for review and approval. Our financial position has improved slightly um, due to adjustments of staffing into the one-time COVID funds. I'm gonna review the COVID funds in a, in a moment. And we've done one-time purchases with the COVID funds. They're, they've been a actual, a, immense help to our, our fiscal position. Uh, the, the, 40, the first interim also includes the budget adjustments we made at the 45 day, which included, and I, I know Mr. Jew went over the accounting of the ESSER funds changed uh, the federal government. Instead of giving us the lump sum, it's, it's now um, a more of a reimbursement type of program. So that kind of implement, uh, made a change to our budget and looks, I don't know, Mr. Danny, you will get there. Are we frozen? Okay. So we also have a new unemployment rate. As you remember, the state suggested a very high unemployment rate that, that is now included in other working um, budget adjustments. And I'll go over some quick revenue and expenditures summaries. So the main story is the COVID funding that we've got since the, the last 18 months. Uh, the CARES funding came out first. We've spent that on PPE and other uh, items. Then we got into the uh, ESSER II. Um, those funds, 10 million of those are in this, this um, year's budget. ELO, we plan to, that's extra learning opportunities. We plan to use some of that next year. We had the in-person grant of 8.6 million, the alphabet soup of, of COVID funds, CRF. That was when we were in distance learning, 11 million. We also had a learning loss mitigation funding uh, and another round of extra learning opportunities. And of course the adopted um, plans are online if anyone wants to look, to look at them. So as we get these funds, we had to develop plans. Great work to our ed services um, department. So with the money, does come additional work. And then the last pot of money, and as you remember, Congress split out, they got the American Rescue Plan done, and then the other half was the in infrastructure. So they did get the last money out, the ESSER three. So that is, we plan on using that next year and the year after. And the totals come up to $80 million in COVID funding uh, over the last um, three and a half years. So that is our story. This has helped us. Um, <clears throat> we've been looking at our third year for a long time. And this has moved since uh, when I found in the office 1718. So it's moved our, it's moved our uh, deficit spending out further so that our fund balance doesn't go down to zero. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. So where we ended last year was in a good position. We came out on our unrestricted side. We came out 10 million ahead. In our unrestricted side, we came out 10 million ahead. The reason for that, our, we were in distance learning. Our utilities were off. We didn't have substitutes over time. We weren't running buses. So we were able to capture 
essentially $20 million of savings by having the campuses closed. But that's not, of course, what we want. I mean, we want our schools open. Um, so we ended the year with about a 16.5% fund balance, which is actually you know, is, is healthy. But what happens is when we project out, um, you know, and when we looked at developing our budget for this year, so this is our original budget. We were projecting a $23.7 million on our unrestricted side loss and coming out ahead 20 million on our restricted. This was at budget adoption before they changed the rules. And I know Mr. Jew went over it. They changed the rule on SR3. So that's in our new budget. And here's what we look like right now. Um, on our unrestricted side, a, a modest deficit spending of 6.3, fund balance of 41.8. On our restricted side, a, a decrease of 8.1. So these are combined uh, 14 and a half million dollar deficit for this year. It's sustainable for a single or two years, but we can't do it continuously or the fund balance will drain down. Uh, so we're, we're anticipating about a 12 and a half percent fund balance at the end of this year at, in June 30th of 2022. So what adjustments we made in the first interim, a difference in some uh, LCFF revenue due to our, our student population and our attendance. So essentially, after we cleaned up, got our budget together, we saw about five million additional revenue after we did the accounting change and we moved people from, uh, from the unrestricted side over to the uh, restricted side using the COVID dollars. Increase of revenue about five. We went through all of our expenditures in the first four months and we were able to kind of come up with a 7.9 of decreased expenditures. Um, I took the liberty to um, take the nine digit uh, numbers that I know were in your other PowerPoint. I hope it's okay, I've got them down. But with rounding, you're, you know, sometimes you're gonna see um, you know, a point off on each, but this gets us down and easier to number, easier to read numbers. The nine digit numbers are in your book um, I'd be happy to, to go over if you have any questions on the exact amounts. The biggest part of the story is our enrollment. Um, we were held harmless. Let's see my green thing. We were held harmless for two years, which is a good thing because the way school finance works is you can you get funded either in the current year or the prior year, whichever is higher. So that kind of helps you weather through ups and downs in your enrollment. But what is the coronavirus has caused since they held us harmless for one year, next year we have nowhere to go back other than the prior year will be this year's attendance. So we will absorb two years of declining enrollment and what they're calling this is the cliff. Um, and good news out of Sacramento is the legislature is meeting about the ADA or, or enrollment cliff that a lot of districts are facing. Um, there's talk of perhaps some help in the January budget, perhaps using some kind of an average, um, some kind of a soft landing tool so that districts don't face this, you know, enrollment drop all in one year, two years of enrollment drop in one year. So news on that, we'll see how that goes. Um, they're, they're talking about different methods to help out. I just want to understand sure. our enrollment. So our current re enrollment is? Uh, 209,921. 20,900. Oh, I'm sorry, that's our ADA. Um, and enrollment is 22085. 2285. And then this line is our ADA, average daily attendance. You'll notice the gap. We usually have like a 95, the kids, you know, typically in past years, 95%. We are facing a little more of a higher absentee rate. Um, and I know staff is working on it, schools are working on it. That's happening across the nation um, for whatever you know reason kids aren't coming into school as much. Uh, on the 22,000 plus enrollment, yes. is that an actual or a projected or? Uh, for, for this year, that is um, October, first week of October. First week of this school yeah, year in October. First Wednesday of October. Okay. 
So that's an actual number that's as an of actual October. For, for 21, 22. Okay. So we have lost 700 students since last year. That's correct. And it's, but it's, it's two years worth of decline. So we don't know, the state said, go ahead and use your, your previous year. They, they called that the hold harmless. So we probably looked something like that. Um, and we do have a uh, demographic study um, lined up with D Davis Demographics and they have all of our feeder school data. So we'll be able to look at what ninth graders are coming in. That's, that's key for us. It's key for staffing. If, if fewer ninth graders are coming in, we're gonna have to staff at a, at a lower, lower level. Um, all of our feeder schools are also facing um, this cliff. They're also facing declining enrollment. So springtime, we should get a better picture of what students are coming in. And then of course our 10th graders become 11th, et cetera. And we can see how their survivor the cohorts survive. Those are pretty solid. Um, but it, the question is how many kids are gonna come over from eighth grade? So when we do um, a budget, uh, first interim, second interim and budget, we do a multi-year. These are projections based on the best data that we have. Um, so this was our adopted budget. Here's our first interim. As I mentioned, we looked at deficit spend about 14 million. Here is our year two, 22, 23. This is at, at full staffing and we do correct these numbers a little bit for declining enrollment, but not entirely. So there's probably some room to also adjust down our expenses. But next year we're projected a $32 million deficit and included in the, the budget or the third year is our fiscal solvency resolution that you did in June. However, that was for 39.6. Now it looks like at 35 million, that will um, be the, what's needed for the third year based on what we know now. And so that's my next slide is what do we, we're here out of Sacramento. Um, so we, you know, our fund balance has recovered. We've used our one-time money, I think wisely to, to keep us going um, forward to offer more services for kids. Um, we still need to do some reductions in the third year. Um, this is what it looks like today based on the assumptions that we were given in June. However, out of Sacramento, our revenues are coming in are outpacing forecasts in the past. And we're seeing um, the legislative analyst office has forecasted a 9.5 billion uh, for new growth for, for Prop 98. Um, <clears throat> people always have, you know, ask me, well, how do I, how do I take 9.5 five and make a number that I could use. Well, there's 6 million students in the state, so you can do some rough math. I mean, that's about 11 to $1,500 per student. So if this holds up, we'll know in January, um, they've equated it to an estimated COLA, 5.35. This news is out on the street, what the LAO, what the governor does with this is another thing. He may decide to use some of this revenue to do some of his special programs. Uh, he loves kindergarten and preschool. Yes. Can you repeat that number as far as the 9.5 billion divided by number of individual students? I heard 11 something, but I, I just want to hear that. Number oh, okay. Again. So there's six, there's 6 million students in the state of California. So yeah, if you, and if you divide it, this is an old guy's trick is like, I always want to know what does that mean for me? And so I divide it. If someone has 9.5 billion and six students, what does that come up to? It gives you, you know, somewhere from a thousand to 15, you know, hundred dollars. Now how the governor decides, well, he, like I say, he loves, he loves preschool, he loves kindergarten, he loves uh, college graduation, you know, so we, we don't know what, what he'll do with this additional amount and what he'll put on the LCFF. So we'll have to just wait and see. So, so I don't like to give, question. I like to so, give rough so, numbers like from 1,000 to 1,500, yeah. Sure, but so because even though it's Prop 98, he has discretion about where it goes. Uh, he makes yeah, as when they when they get together, the big three, they start negotiating on on what what to do with um, the forecasted revenue. It's it's a big bargaining. Probably you're probably aware. I mean, they they meet in committee, and the governor has his 
the legislature has there and they, you know, sometime in May, the governor gives his final May proposal and then they finally vote on. So we're a long ways away. Um, the news is good. The news is hopeful. Uh, it could help our district immensely. We still have to be frugal and, you know, have a program of austerity, but we can fix that third year out. Um, I mentioned the COLA. Uh, and I mentioned the discussions about a soft landing on declining enrollment. Many districts in the state are facing this. You know, is there enough political pressure to do something to help out with an LCFF districts that are declining? Now, if you're a basic aid district and your enrollment goes down, you're okay. Um, you have fewer kids um, and you have the same amount of property taxes coming in. So we're, the thought would be they would help out LCFF districts but you never know in politics and to see. So next we'll be back with the governor's budget proposal. I think we'll have some more information on what the out year looks like. Um, again, we'll be bringing the uh, financial and bond um, final audits. I know the committee met, we look like we're on target. We met with our uh, outside auditor. We hope to bring those to you and we'll bring you the second interim in March. And then we start the budget development and then that's for 22-23. And again, that looks like we, we have enough reserves to do 22-23 and we'll have new funding, but we have to keep our eye on the third year up. And then staff recommends approval of the uh, first interim and any questions, I'd be happy to. Oops. Um, we'll have some comments by board members, but let's have a motion on the floor for positive certification of the first interim financial report. I'll move to approve. Recommend. Moved by Cortez, seconded by Doe, and we'll just hold that for any comments or questions before we vote or, or public comment. There is one public comment on this item. Go ahead. Public comment by parent Kevin Larson. The budget has an elephant in the room, so to speak, because ESUHSD owes 35 million coming up fast, perhaps 12 months from now. We have not prepared properly for this. And two, we have not acted with buy-in from the students and parents and teachers and classified too. The outside community has not a clue that we're planning to cut 250 jobs, which will impact student learning and climate at schools. We need to ask the teachers and parents what they want rather than impose a hatchet plan in secrecy. We need to set up a task force on how to meet this 35 million and shift cuts to other areas rather than teacher and classified jobs. We need to cut the district office jobs and other jobs that are not teacher jobs nor elective teachers. Kids need to have metal shop, wood shop and other things. That is the end of public comment. Thank you for that public comment. I'll just briefly note that um, the projections cited by uh, Mr. Larson are based on earlier uh, uh, fiscal data, uh, based on an adopted budget. Um, our experience is that it's driven by third year uh, projections, which for which we have insufficient data. Uh, already it's changing and it's projected to change even more. There's gonna be nowhere near those level of reductions in force or layoffs. Uh, nowhere near uh, the kinds of, uh, uh, of actions that are called for in, in a, the adopted resolution. Uh, we are simply working within a system and with the constraints given to us by the state and county uh, fiscal uh, system. Uh, and he is right in noting those figures, but they're a little out of context. Uh, they will change dramatically by the time we actually reach decisions in March for any potential layoffs or in June for an adopted budget, those stratospheric figures will come down significantly, if not dramatically. Um, and Mr. Willihan, I wanna say that or ask uh, at the school boards conference, statewide school board conference that we attended, uh, I was in a session by the capital advisors. And one thing they started out with was a comment that at the state level, uh, there, there are these projections for 
for, for a great increase in revenues by the legislative analyst office. Um, and the characterization was the state is just a wash in money. Everywhere you look, it's more money, money, money. You indicated that the LAO, the legislative analyst office, is projecting a nine point something billion increase in Prop 98. Does that take into account these current projections of the LAO of what I understood to be at least 33 billion could go as high as 40 something billion in new revenues? Or is that not factored into what you're able to present because it's still not an official number? Yeah, yeah excellent question that, that in our multi years, no. And typical practice is not to build in numbers, but it's fair enough to build in January proposal numbers mm -hmm. into our out years mm -hmm. and definitely at budget adoption, build in the out years. So as you mentioned, capital advisors, school services, uh, among others, provide us with these assumption factors. So right. you're absolutely, in, in our March second interim, we'll see these numbers. Right, and we're not really free to incorporate those numbers until they're actually in the pipeline of right. the state and county fiscal system. But right. common knowledge at the state capital level and by people who track the inside movement, they're already expecting that there's gonna be a movement for the better fiscally and financially that is gonna to come to the district. And the question is going to be, is it an increase in the base funding or simply one-time funding? But we're not gonna be looking at the catastrophic numbers that we had to abide by based on what we knew in earlier months. So I just wanna reemphasize that point. So thank you, any Good comments point. before we vote on the motion? Any other comments or questions? Hearing none, seeing none, there is a, Oh, uh, no, let me just call the vote. Uh, let me ask our student representative, how do you vote? I will vote yes. However, I do think what the parent brings up about- I'm not, I'm not understanding you with your mask on. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, I will vote, vote yes on the report. However, I think moving forward when it comes to like the budgetary processes, I definitely think student voice and just community voice is not involved as much as it should be. Because um, again, like whenever there's like budget cuts or anything like that, it directly impacts us. It directly impacts the services that are meant to support us and make ensure our academic success. And so I think moving forward, we really need to, especially in like the year 2022, we need to focus on um, hearing student voices directly, not just from the student governing board, not just from the students who have been consistently showing up, but from the students who have actually been historically underheard in these conversations and hearing what their needs are and going from there to, in order to protect their services as much as possible and seeing how we can allocate funds for them and allocate for more services because you know we do need more teachers, we do need more counselors, we do need more support systems. And when those become cut from the budget, it really is so harmful to our school environments. And again, um, we need to do better in ensuring that student voice is placed on the priority for budgetary measure, measures. Great, point well taken. And I would uh, say that with your leadership and Trustee uh, Cortez's leadership, uh, the upcoming budget process uh, really does need to be sure that it has student voice uh, in it. Tonight is just an administrative report and not a budget process. So members of the board, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Abstentions? Passes unanimously. Moving on to the next item, which is public hearings, 11.01. .01, hold public hearing uh, regarding the proposed adoption of the initial proposal for contract reopeners for 2022-2023 and 2023-2024 from Eastside Union High School District to the Eastside Teachers Association slash CTA slash NEA. And I would call this hearing to order. Uh, and this is an opportunity now that public hearing is open uh, for comments uh, on the proposed adoption of these initial proposals for contract reopeners. Do we have any anyone stepping forward? I'm seeing that there is no one signed up and no one in the chambers that is stepping up. I will call a second time, is there anyone who wishes to speak on this item? I'm gonna call for the third and final time. Is there anyone who wishes to speak uh, on this item for contract reopeners? Okay, hearing none um, and seeing none and hearing none, 
I'm closing the public hearing on this item and moving on to 11.02. Uh, and this is discussion and or action regarding the same item. Uh, does the administration have a comment on this? Thank you. Thank you, Board President. This is just a reopener for salaries only, Articles 26.1 and 26.2 for our ESTA bargaining units. Okay. Um, and again, are, are, is there anyone who uh, who is uh, signed up to speak or comment on this? Okay, there are none. So uh, I'm going to move on with the agenda then to. We have action. We need action. We need I'm sorry, action. we do need action on this. So a motion for approval. Move for approval. Moved by Lay, seconded by Doe. Uh, student representative, how do you vote? I vote yes. Thank you. And members of the board, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Passes unanimously. Moving on to item point 1201. This is members, uh, public members who wish to address the board. Are there any requests to speak? There are two speakers on this item. Public comment from community member, Dr. Joel Herrera. I am the brother of Jay Manuel Herrera. Tonight, I acknowledge the start of Board President Herrera's 32nd year of service. I honor President Herrera's lengthy and faithful service by sharing a little personal story about him. Did you know that President Herrera was a Sunday school teacher? In his teenage years, and because of his faithful involvement in church, President Herrera was assigned a class and taught Sunday school to eight to 10 years young church members. I was in President Herrera's class, as was my younger brother, Humberto. I thank President Herrera for being my Sunday school teacher and for his years of service to the Eastside Union High School District. Peace and blessings to Brother J. Manuel Herrera. May you have a fantastic 32nd year of service on the board. Thank you, brother. I'll send the payment that I promised. No, just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm totally surprised by that comment. And I really take it to heart. Thank you, brother Joel, who's a retired superintendent. Public comment from parent Kevin Larson. The placement of this agenda item causes parents to wait around when they wish to make a comment, a general comment. Parents might wait as long as an hour. So it is requested that this 1201 item on general comments to the board be always placed earlier. For example, this item should be moved next board meeting after the 5.1 item on this meeting. To come earlier is important and other school districts such as Evergreen move the general comments to the board earlier on the agenda. Now, what is done is first, the classified union person has a five minute opportunity to share out. Then second, the teacher union leader gets five minutes. Then general public gets to line up for two minutes at beginning of open session. Let's look into this, suggested a year ago by me. That is the end of comment under 1201. Thank you for the comment. And under this part of the agenda, the board is not able to engage in any discussion. Appreciate the comment. And are there any other comments? Okay, we do not have any others signed up for comment. Moving on to item 13, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Operational Items, Board Discussion and or Action 13.01, action regarding discussion and or action regarding update on no, do we pronounce it novel or novel? The novel coronavirus, COVID-19 adopt resolution authorizing remote teleconference meetings. Mr. Superintendent. Thank you. As, uh, as we do here in each of our meetings, I'm gonna be showing you some of the data that we currently have, talk to you a little bit where we are with our dashboard. And then if there's any just kind of new guidelines from the state, make sure we know that and then give us an opportunity to adopt a resolution that allows us to hold virtual meetings if necessary. So the data out of Santa Clara that we can see in terms of um, new cases, we can see that the number the seven day rolling average is now at 231. We're not seeing a spike like we are in other, in other areas of the country and other areas of the state. And I'm also not seeing a high an increase in hospitalizations as a result of this. Um, a couple of months ago, I think I presented at 167. So we are at about uh, a higher rate, but one that is leveling off. This is the data as it regards to vaccinations. And you can see that for ages 12 and above, we're over 91% as a county. 
And also, if you look to the right here, you see those new purple, the new purple lines are those residents who have received their booster dose. And so we're already tracking over half a million uh, county residents who have um, done, uh, gone and gotten that booster. Uh, booster. This is our COVID-19 dashboard. Currently with staff, we have zero positive cases. Um, and in, with students, we did uh, see an uptick up to 19. Um, this is the rolling 10-day uh, count. And so as we end this end this year, we're at zero with staff and 19 student. In our adult education program, we continue at zero. We know we talked about the health order that was released on August 11th. And we can see as of today, we have 84% of staff who have verified their vaccination and continue to work with them. I would like to mention that the booster information for our, for our families, I just wanna make sure, I know we're a high school district, but I just wanna make sure that we're all looking uh, for the, in terms of public health to see that for in our county for ages five to 11, uh, we're, st we're seeing um, already 42% um, of those age students are students that have been vaccinated and just wanna share this out to encourage families to seek vaccination for those students that are five to 11 in our elementary and feeder districts. Um, so they continue that strong buildup to high school through participation. Also wanna let our, our high school age students know that uh, currently now with the, with, the, with the Pfizer, that if you are now 16 years and old, older, you are eligible. So previously it was 18. So this, uh, this extends the opportunity for a booster for more of our high school age students. And by the way, I'm told if you drink water before your booster, you won't have the side effects like I did. I wanna thank board member Cortezzi for telling me that the day after I got my booster and not before, that was super helpful. <laughs> All right. We do have some new travel information and some guidelines from the CDC that were recently released. And I just put this out there. It will go into our board summary. So as, as staff and families travel, perhaps over the next couple of weeks that they're aware. So there is the expectation in terms of the guidelines that travels who are returning from out of state, whether it's out of country or out of state, uh, should follow the CDC travel guidelines and they should expect to be tested within three to five days upon arrival. And that student or travelers who test positive or symptomatic of COVID-19 should isolate and follow those public health recommendations. For international travel, um, it is the recommendation is if you are not fully vaccinated, do not. If you choose to travel, uh, please make sure that you test three to five days after travel, self-monitor and definitely quarantine if testing positive. If you're not fully vaccinated, in addition to testing, uh, the recommendation is to self-quarantine. But once again, these are guidelines from CDC. And so we would just once again, encourage all our staff and families to get the vaccination and to follow health guidelines per travel. Our next steps is to continue monitoring our data as we have, continue looking for the vaccination verification for staff, prepare, uh, prepare for when the state takes action and is ready for student vaccination but also so that you know that when we return from the break, we'll look to see if there was any sort of spike or any kind of change or any kind of new strand through travel that presents itself and that we'll be calling for a meeting of the task force after our break to review field trip protocols and vaccination and testing protocols for staff and students. So that's, that's work that's coming. Our ask for this evening is uh, to approve the resolution the um, resolution to continue our virtual board meetings. As we know, we have to do this every 30 days and we've got a little gap with, uh, without a meeting there. So we bring this resolution for your action. Move for approval. Move, yeah. <laughs> second. Moved by um, Chavez and seconded by Doe. Uh, any questions, any further comments? If not all in favor, please say aye. Oops, you're right. Huh? Yeah. Student representative, vote, having yes. a vote? Oh, good. I mean, board members all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstentions, and it passes unanimously. On to 13.02, discussion and or action to receive and adopt second reading of senior manager of internal audit proposed annual audit work plan for 2021-2022. 
I'd like to move okay. for approval. Okay, that's uh, by Member Doe moving for approval. Is there a second? A second. Seconded by Member Cortez. All in, uh, student representative, how do you vote? I vote yes. Thank you, members of the board. All in favor, please say aye. President aye. Herrera, we have public comment. There is oh, public comment on this. Okay, side. I should ask <laughs> if there's public comment. Uh, we just took a vote, but we're going to take public comment. Go ahead. Public comment by parent Kevin Larson. The attachment by the internal auditor is too vague and not done properly. It should be a kind of report that the general public can read. I ask this be changed for future meetings. We pay our workers well, and they need to submit reports for the public to view, not bullet points. That is the end of public comment under this item. Thank you for that comment. And we're gonna move on to item 13.03, discussion and or action to approve waiver of third meeting requirement for the audit committee charter. Again, uh, an item by our senior internal auditor. Do we need a comment on this or come on okay, come forward, please? Thank you. And if, could you remove your mask for speaking? Turn on the microphone. Kelly Kwong, senior manager of internal audit. In accordance with the audit committee charter, we were supposed to meet three times per calendar year. But for 2021, we have met twice thus far. We do have a, a meeting scheduled for Tuesday, January 26, to finish reviewing our fiscal year financial statements. Um, so we will be meeting four times in the calendar year of 2022. So therefore, I am asking the board to approve and waive the requirement of the third meeting for the calendar year 2021. Okay, so move to, to approve. Moved by Cortese, seconded by Lay. We have Stu public comment. We have a public comment. Ooh, I've got to remember to ask. Go ahead. I believe that we put into a corner with say five days left of work time for adult for adult commit audit committee. So it is clear the board will need to approve only two meetings for audit committee. But this is wrong and shows poor planning by audit committee. We must honor what we say we will do with Zoom meetings and have three audit meetings a year. So we did not do well here and it needs to be asked why privately by someone in key management at ESUHSD. That is the end of public comment under this item. And I'm sorry, I missed and that's a comment by? I'm, so, I'm sorry, uh, parent Kevin Larson. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for that comment. Um, student representative, how do you vote on this motion? I vote yes, and also I have to go right now. My mom is here to pick me up. Okay, you are duly excused. <laughs> yeah. As soon as, and uh, we wish you well. Thank and you Happy so New much. Year. And, yeah, and have a great day. break, everyone. All right, you take care. Thank you for your service, Paul. Thank you for your service and do well in those finals. <laughs> okay, so we're needing now to call the vote on the motion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, abstentions, and passes unanimously, thank you. Moving on to item 14 on educational services, 1401 discussion and or action to adopt the educator effectiveness grant plan. Good evening, Marta Guerrero, Director of Instruction. As you may recall at the last board meeting, I presented our district's uh, plan for the educator effectiveness block grant. Uh, which is meant to support the professional learning of our teachers, our paraeducators, certificated uh, classified staff and administrators. And I'm here tonight to ask for your approval of the plan as was presented to you on November the 18th. I will move to approve. I think this is such an, an amazing opportunity and thank you for pursuing it. I know it was a lot of work in a very short amount of time, but um, this is really a tremendous investment for our staff. And uh, moved by Cortez, who was it seconded by? Seconded by Member Doe. Any comments or questions? If not, all in favor, please say aye. Oops, <laughs> I'm gonna learn. There's no public comment under this No item. public comment. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, abstentions, passes unanimously. Thank you, moving on to, where am I? Where am I? Okay, 14.02, discussion and or action to approve 
school field trips? We have two field trips on the agenda. They are both beyond the 60 miles. They are day trips uh, for our wrestling teams. And uh, given the current situation, we're bringing it to you for discussion and uh, for approval and for a decision. And the recommendation by administration is? We recommend approval. They are day trips. Uh, even the one that has multiple days, parents have committed, Evergreen Valley High School parents have committed to drive the students back and forth to Napa for the tournament. There is public comment on this item. Okay, public comment, please. Public comment by parent Veronica Andrade. I respectfully, respectfully ask that the board approves the Evergreen Valley Wrestling Team to attend the Napa Valley Wrestling Tournament. This is one of the best tournaments for our girls to attend and is something they look forward to every year. As a parent of a freshman wrestler who has been working hard for several months in keeping up her grades in order to get herself to this tournament. She has been working since she was in junior high for this. She knows this is going to be a challenging tournament, but as a student athlete, she also knows that this will only help her to improve and is one of the best challenges prior to being able to see herself on the state podium. I'm asking that you don't take this away from her and the other girls who work hard daily on a monthly basis. New women's college wrestling programs are being established and our girls have a great chance of getting noticed by these colleges when they are on the state podium. That is the end of public comment under this item. Thank you. There was motion by member Lay and we need a second. Second by member You Joe. know what? I just want to acknowledge the parents for their willingness to drive all the way to now. What's that's like a three hour drive up and back two days in a row. I mean, Wow. Really, kudos to you for your, your commitment to your students. This is really great. So, yeah, I'm, told about I'm glad you offered that comment, Member Cortese. And it's beautiful to see that now there is expansion of women in wrestling. Yeah. Remember, once <laughs> upon a time when I was a middle schooler and a high schooler, there was no such thing. It was like one girl, two girls, myself included in the wrestling team. Oh, you were? I was for three Ooh. years. Ooh. Varsity YB um my freshman year so so that that really um that resonates a lot um and so i also want to thank the parent who made that comment and advocated for her daughter um because that is not very very common um so with a lot of a lot of excitement i say yes have i called the vote on this yet? <laughs> okay all in favor please say aye aye, aye. opposed abstentions it passes unanimously thank you member thank you uh, moving on to item 15 on business services, 15.01, discussion and or action to approve the contracts for professional services over 25,000. Move to approve. Okay. <laughs> Move by Cortese, second and by Doe. They're a really on the mark tag team here. Uh, any other comments? Any, any, okay. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions, it passes unanimously. 15.01, to approve a facilities use agreement between Eastside Union High School District and San Jose State University. Do we need a comment on this or do, are we ready for a motion? Yeah, I think this is just the agreement uh, between San Jose State and the uh, wellness services they provide, is that right? Yes, earlier, in a prior meeting, you approved the MOU and the entire relationship in terms of providing services. Okay. This is just a facilities uh, use agreement. To so a, move to for approval, approval by Member Doe and seconded by? Chavez. Chavez, okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? It passes unanimously. 15.03, discussion and or action to approve the one-day material decrease of school attendance for Independence High School on Tuesday, November 9. 2021, and that was due to a, uh, an emergency situation at the school. A second. Moved by Member Doe, seconded by Member Cortese. If there's no comment, are there any? No, we don't have comments on these. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Passes unanimously. Item 16, Human Resources, 16.01, discussion and or action to approve memorandum of understanding between California School Employees Association and its East Foothills Chapter 187 and the East Union High School District regarding 
the classified employee summer assistance program. Thank you, Board President. This is a, an annual uh, MOU that we agree upon. It doesn't cost the district any money, but it enables our classified employees to participate in the summer assistance program, which essentially set, uh, they're able to set aside a, uh, up to 9% of their salary that the state would match and then pay out during the summertime. These are mainly for 10 month employees. Second. Moved by Doe, seconded by Chavez. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? It passes unanimously. So item 17, facilities bond 17.01 discussion and or action to approve proposed amendments to the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee bylaws. I'll move to approve. These are very, very minor. Okay, second. Moved by Cortese, seconded by Doe. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? We have public comment here. With that yeah, said, though, I would like to rec uh, recognize Barry Schimmel, who, can, <laughs> who is our new chairperson of this uh, <laughs> of this committee. Who, and you've been uh, waiting to, to speak. Talk these items we can't just go right from <laughs> Good evening, Board of Education and Superintendent Vanderzee. Uh, thank you very much. I love the way this board Please operates. state your name for the record. Barry Schimmel. I happen to be the current chair of your Bond Oversight Committee. And the only comment I would make is that East Side has one of the best bond programs in the state of California. And I think that's based on two things. One, a very, very competent staff and a board that has put bonds on the ballot and a citizens oversight committee that has been your public relations firm for sharing with the community that the money spent well, it is keeping the East Side Union High School District competitive with some terrific facilities that are some of the best in the county. And so what you just approved gives a little more representation to the committee by having two board members and two committee members screen the applicants for the committee because it's made a tremendous difference in the last six or eight years. So I thank you for your vote of approval. Good evening. Good Thank to see you for your service. There is Thank public you. comment. There is so public the comment. board is so appreciative of the service by our uh, citizens bond oversight committee members and for your leadership, Mr. Shimmel. Uh, this takes time, and uh, the community relies on your uh, investment of time and review and uh, ascertaining whether the intent of the voters is being followed. That's a, an extremely valuable service. There, Thank you so much. And for there is public comment on this side. And for my colleagues who don't know, Mr. Schimmel comes with tremendous years of experience and expertise in, in this area. So we are very blessed to have him. Is there a comment on this item? Yes, there is. Public comment from parent Kevin Larson. We have people wishing to serve on the bond committee who work for companies that like to develop land for school districts. So this may be a conflict of interest. I have asked this be reviewed one year ago. Other school districts do this. They have a form all members must sign who work on citizens bond oversight. And that form is a conflict of interest form. We must implement this form to ensure no conflict of interest happens in the citizens oversight committee. It is good practice for some of the bond projects that are 15 million or more and to the process of bidding is strange and may be illegal in my parent opinion. We need more scrutiny over the process of bond project selection and more, in my humble parent opinion, more data is being gathered on this group. That is the end of public comment under this item. Thank you. And it strikes me as a valid comment that the administration and the leadership of the Citizen Bonds Oversight Committee may want to look into as a best practice. I don't fully understand the, the, all the dimensions of the comment, but it just strikes me as worthy of some kind of review and consideration. Uh, moving on to, uh, oh, yes, President Mayor. Herrera, I know you mentioned last time when this came up about the Oversight Committee, their responsibility, and Barry came back, is to review the expenditures. Uh, the board selects the pro projects and, and staff does, does the um, bidding process. So the comment indicates that the Oversight Committee selects projects, and that's just not Okay, the, the part that I was keying in on was the conflict of interest uh, um, uh, best practice to just ensure that uh, that as other bond oversight committees do apparently per the comment. Uh, put the board's uh, mind at rest. 
uh, as a member of the committee, you sign a conflict of interest form. And so we're I do, already doing that. I do construction management. I have never done nor intend to do work in the East Side Union High School District. So there is no conflict of interest. Uh, the speaker is ill-informed and we'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Mr. Schimmel. Moving on to the consent calendar. Do I have a motion? Move for approval. I'll second. Moved by, moved by Chavez and seconded by Cortezi uh, for the approval of the consent calendar. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? And it passes unanimously which takes us to number 23, written reports, recommendations. We have two, 23.02, the quarterly, received quarterly report on Santa Clara County Treasury investment portfolio and 23.03, received Santa Clara County Office of Education adopted budget approval letter. Uh, and the practice here is if, if the board wants to bring them back for discussion, we can do that. We're simply receiving them here. There is public comment on 2303. Okay, let's hear the comment on item 23.03 on the County Office of Education adopted budget approval letter. Public comment by parent Kevin Larson. I strongly encourage the district to plan in advance to meet the new requirements for the LCAP and for the 2022-23 reserve limitations. This was the comment made by Dr. Dewan of the Santa Clara County Office of Education in this letter, and it is a warning to Eastside Union High School District, in my opinion, that Eastside Union High School District board members need to find ways to cut millions of dollars instead of doing strange 250 worker job cuts. The 250 job cuts do not add up to 35 million. It is my view they add up to 20 million, so we have an additional 10 million to cut. Ron Willihan is tops at his game. I asked the board to meet in close session with him and ask him for advice on where to make cuts. The Eastside Union High School District School Board is stagnant in how it operates, so I asked the school board members to take heed of the statement made by Dr. Dewan of the Santa Clara County Office of Education. Have lots of close session talks. That is the end of public comment under this section. Thank you for that comment. And I will simply say that these letters and everything pertains to data that has already begun to change significantly. It is no longer the actual data on which to make decisions and they're gonna continue changing for the better as we approach March uh, for any potential layoff notices. And, and, at, and then as we get to June to adopt the budget, the numbers that are being looked at and that this letter refers to are just not gonna be relevant anymore. And that's a pattern that has persisted for five, 10, 15 years. Uh, and it's a pattern that is continuing. So thank you. We're gonna move on to item 24, 24.01 opportunity for the board of trustees to request items on future agendas. Members of the board. Okay, I hear no uh, requests and uh, we, 24.02 simply list the items that are on the docket right now, and we'll just leave them there for the record. Uh, moving on to, oh, item 25, Board of Trustees, Superintendent comments, communications beginning with 25.01 comments by the Board of Trustees. I'll start to my far right, uh, Member Lay. I would like to say thank you uh, for all teachers, staff um, that worked very hard during the COVID-19, as well as uh, we approached for the holiday. So this is the last board meeting before we, you know, uh, going to go home and celebrate uh, holidays with family. And I think is uh, I want to appreciate all of my board members that support me for during my year as a president be it president of the um, school board, um, uh, you know, at East Side. So it's a tremendously um, honor. And um, I, I really appreciate it. I mean, every, every day that I look back and 
this is my 11 years. That's amazing. Next year is my 12th. That's my third term. And I'm learning every day. I'm learning from each one of you. And I can say that uh, this is a wonderful board uh, that I've been working for one of those years and that continue to work and support you know, all of us so we can achieve um, the goal for our student and, and the goal to support uh, teachers, staff, because uh, we used to have, uh, you know, a long way to catch up with during the COVID-19 that's really um, decreased our effort to move on for everything in our life. Um, and I just want to say also that um, last, uh, last week we did attend CSBA conference I'm glad that I got to have time to uh, spend a bit of time with our board members, as well as other board colleagues um, at the conference. Um, quite learning a lot about the CSBA conference, uh, but I know a couple uh, session that they make it, you know, very short, only one session, and everybody will jam up uh, to get to, uh, enter into the conference uh, session. But one thing I really want to bring back is um, the parent engagement issue that I still want dear to my heart that we need to be involved with parents so they can support a student. And I hope that uh, we can, you know, find another solution or find another way to work you know, and help support parent engagement. Um, that's all I have and uh, enjoy a holiday and happy holiday. Thank you. Board Clerk Cortezzi. Um, thank you. I don't have a lot to add. Um, I, I missed you all in San Diego, but I got to enjoy the CSBA conference in the luxury of my own home. <laughs> attending sessions in my yoga pants. So uh, it was a great, it was a great conference and I was, I was glad to um, have, be able to participate that way. Thank you. Board Vice President Chavez. Yes. Um, so I, I also attended a CSBA conference in San Diego um, and amongst the number of things that are top of mind, one of the things that I'm really excited to, to do this upcoming year is equity walks with um, Van. Um, so walking our, our campuses um, and just really doing some learning and some deep dives into what we see. Um, so really excited about that. Um, so that's one thing. Um, another thing is I, I just, before we, we end tonight, I just wanna extend gratitude again for everybody in our Eastside community, our teachers, our students, our staff, um, our community members for, my gosh, making it through uh, the first half of the year and coming back. It has been a huge undertaking to say the least for every single person. Everybody has played a role in making sure that our students are set up for success to the best of our ability um, and the work continues. Um, but I think there's a lot to be acknowledged and a lot of gratitude to extend. So I wanna make sure that we made that note and I hope people do take the time to relax and do something for themselves um, to rejuvenate so that they can come at least a little bit more energized um, in the new year. So happy holidays and happy new year. Board member Doe. I like my colleagues, I like the staff. So I will save my comment for next year. <laughs> Hey, that's my happy holiday. holidays. <laughs> Thank you. I'll make my comment. Uh, I have to begin with appreciation for my colleagues and their putting their trust in me to serve uh, this next term as board president. Uh, I don't take it lightly and uh, I will do my best to serve you and the district. Um, and um, I was going to say something else and I forgot. So uh, I will conclude my remarks and ask the superintendent for his comments. 
just want to thank everybody, our students who returned and faced the challenges of in-person instruction, our seniors who applied for colleges with great anxiety about what they were going to be looking for and how they would be evaluating this experience and sticking with it. I want to thank all our staff who uh, dealt with the physical fears of masking and social distancing the start of the year, but then all our classified and certificated staff who then moved on to say, hey, these students are going to need additional supports and being back in a community, knowing what that means and norming ourselves towards what it means to be an Eastside student and move to success. And that wasn't always easy. I mean, at times it was hard and it was time like, where's the help gonna come from? And it came from a community. And so I wanna just thank all the adults that were part about truly welcoming students as they are, seeing that there were areas of growth and finding ways to positively respond. Uh, we've done good work this semester. We started the semester tired. I think we're probably even more so now. So let's rest and come back knowing that we've got a great opportunities in the second semester with our youth on the side. Thanks to everybody. Thank you. And the comment I couldn't remember simply was to wish everyone happy holidays and <laughs> I'll see you in the new year. <laughs> um, 20, item 25.04, uh, board meeting evaluation, board member comments. I mean, a meeting that gets done at 829, that's. <laughs> Oops. Um, if there are no other comments on board meeting evaluation, we're gonna go to item 26.01, legal counsel report on closed session actions. Closed session agenda item 2.02, .02, student expulsions. Expulsion number 21-22-13. Motion by member Herrera, um, second by member Doe. Uh, the expulsion was approved unanimously. Student 21-22-14. A motion by member Cortese, second by member Doe. The board unanimously approved the ex suspended expulsion of student-14. Student 21-22-15, motion by member Lay, second by member Doe, the board unanimously approved the expulsion of a student-15. Agenda item 2.04, motion by member Chavez, second by member Herrera, the board unanimously approved uh, the appointment and employment of Miriam Adelot as director of student services. Closed session item 2.07, uh, a motion by member Herrera to reject the claim for damages of Z Perez. Uh, that motion was seconded by member Cortese and was the rejection of that claim was unanimously approved by the board. There are no further additional reportable actions. So our next meetings in January will be January 13 and January 22nd. Oh, no, excuse me, January 13 and January 27. There will be a board retreat on January 22. This meeting is now concluded and adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>